are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about how two teenagers became killers. Now, when the young make innocence a pure thing of the past, the fear that innocence no longer exists runs rampant. It's unbelievable to eyes that have never witnessed it. For those who have, they know that evil can live in the smallest of spaces. I also want to thank our sponsor, Albert. Now, Albert is actually this free to download financial monitoring app that is so incredibly helpful for your finance needs. Not only does it allow mobile banking, but it helps with your budgeting and your savings. And my favorite part is actually that you can put all of your different streams of income, all of your different bills that are going to be taken out so that Albert can really look at your finances all around and decide how much you can actually save. With the Albert savings feature, they set aside small amounts to help you reach your goals and then they place that into a savings account for you. You can link multiple accounts through Albert to keep you organized and it's an app that is right there on your phone for you. And on top of that, there are no overdraft charges, no maintenance fees, or minimum balances like traditional banks have. They can also spot up to $250 from your next paycheck. You get your own little card from Albert and they actually have have geniuses which are financial experts there to help you with any questions you have as well so if you would like to download it just check in the description box or go to albert.com slash brooke mckenna to download albert for free today that's albert.com slash brooke mckenna and for a limited time when you open a checking account and connect a qualifying direct deposit you will get 150 dollars so make sure to check it out now let's get back to the story So it was 2001 in New Hampshire, and Half and Suzanne Zantop were a married couple living in Etna. This was not far from Hanover. Now, they were 62 and 55 years old, and they had been married for 31 years with two now-grown children who were Veronica and Mariana. They had actually met while studying at Stanford University, where they realized they had both been born in Germany and both knew German, English, Spanish, and French. Now, Half was actually going for his PhD in geology while Suzanne was getting her master's in political science. After they graduated, they decided they wanted to go on to get a job in the same place to be closer together, and the two of them actually became professors at Dartmouth College, where they made a name for themselves in what they were teaching, and they were very well respected. Half was a professor of geology and earth sciences. He loved to take his students out on field trips, and he was very lively. A lot of people said that even in boring meetings, he would have this lively wit about him that made meetings survivable. And the same with his teaching. And with Suzanne, she taught and was the chair of the German department, as well as a feminist who fought for that in her free time. And she was the graduate director of the Comparative Literature MA program. And on top of that, she also authored and edited several books. They were widely respected as a couple and as individuals and as teachers. They were well known and they loved their positions and what they did for these kids. And at home, they were devoted parents. Even after the kids, you know, grew up and kind of moved out on their own, the couple wasn't only known for their teachings, but also their welcoming home and treating these students like they were their own children. Long ago that they had decided that it would be a place for anyone from Dartmouth College to come and feel comfortable, whether that be faculty members, students, or visitors wanting to learn more. And so with the 50 years experience that they had together, they were more than willing to share their knowledge on the college and also their respective teachings. By 2000, the couple was kind of nearing retirement and they were looking forward to this. As much as they adored their jobs, they also wanted a break. And Half and Suzanne actually weren't expecting it to come very soon, but they were ready for after a few years of work, getting to settle down and get to relax a bit. However, they wouldn't have to wait long for it all to end. 
and they would have never wished for it to end the way that it did. You see, the next year, on January 27th of 2001, the Xantops were having a little dinner get-together at their home. They often had these dinner parties with friends, family friends, and they also invited their co-workers. And so Roxanne Verona, a co-worker, arrived first at the home and wasted no time calling the police. With the door unlocked, she had seen what no human should have to. And the news of these two beloved professors' deaths came like a tsunami to this college town. Even the local officers of Aetna believed that this was a joke when it was coming over the radio because it was so absurd. Aetna was so small and so comfortable. And Half and Suzanne's deaths would have been saddening enough, but the fact that it was a murder was even more horrific to comprehend. The rumors circled, blasting that Half and Suzanne were lying in their own blood in the study, and that's when the gossip got nasty. While the media was scrambling for updates on the case, the small town neighbors were trying to come up with a reason why they would have been murdered. And so they began to say that Half was having an affair on Suzanne, and that the other woman had murdered them both in a crime of passion after finding out. Yet no one who actually knew them believed that Half would ever do this. He was a devoted husband who would do nothing of the sorts. However, they had no idea that actually the investigators were theorizing a murder-suicide. Investigators were keeping this investigation relatively quiet due to the amount of coverage it was getting because of the connection to the Ivy League college. Students and parents alike from that school were anxious that these college kids shouldn't be near campus and faculty was wondering if they were actually the next target. Meanwhile, investigators had found the couple in the study with half lying on his right side with his head on the bottom shelf of the bookcase and Suzanne was lying near the entrance. Now, the entire room was a mess with a table actually collapsed between them and a desk chair on its side. Trash can was overturned, a rug was moved off the floor and papers were everywhere. There was also two chairs sat upright at a desk as though a conversation was being had at that table table, but the rest of the house appeared to be in normal condition and in the kitchen it appeared as though someone had been in the middle of cooking a meal. Amongst the chaos though, there was a telephone book, but it was open to the page of the T's. Now from there, investigators didn't know if they actually found that number or had to go online to further search and so they woke up the desktop that was in the study area and when they moved the mouse and the screen came alive it did display a search engine for names and addresses however whoever had been searching had cleared the evidence of what they searched for crime scene investigators were able to locate a fingerprint a footprint that was bloody and two knife sheaths that were from nine to ten inches with black straps and one of them had a triangular design on it but the knives were not inside now autopsies revealed that half and suzanne had been stabbed to death half ten times and suzanne eleven both of their throats had been cut and the footprint that was found was determined to be from a hiking boot this made the rumor of this being some sort of crime of passion done by the mistress not so crazy after all because investigators knew that stabbing was a method of killing that is normally done very aggressively, very personally. And it was as if whoever had done this had known Half and Suzanne and were very upset at them and had gone after them on purpose. Since there were two knife sheaths, they believed that it was a good possibility that there were two killers, but the murder also was kind of crossed off as being a robbery because nothing was taken that was valuable at all. Investigators were then informed that there was someone who believed they could have been a witness to something. They spoke to investigators and claimed that they had seen a man speeding out of the couple's driveway in a green Volvo station wagon. And this was before, of course, they were found dead the day before. And the description that was given was that he was a thin white man in his 20s with no facial hair. And this was one of the only tips that had been given the entire investigation. Now, from this small close-knit town, no one appeared to know much, but everyone wanted to know everything. The New Hampshire State Police were sent to the small team of Hanover police who were working 
in this crime scene in Etna. Airports, taxis, buses, and every mode of transportation that could be traced were looked into for the day of the murders in case the killers tried to flee. And that's when they came across a young man who was on campus and he had actually gotten a taxi that very night to go home. The driver claimed to have dropped him off at the Manchester airport, but this boy appeared to have no connection to the Xantops. However, investigators wanted to speak with him just in case and they got him on the phone and he said he had to go home for a family emergency. Now, with no evidence really to connect him, they did leave him there and let him be. Those who had something against the Xantops were a very small pool. In fact, it was pretty much no one. But those who knew them, that was an entirely different chaos that needed to be gone through and the staff at the Dartmouth College needed to be questioned as well as all the students and all of their possible connections to Half and Suzanne and why they would want to kill them and so it was going to be a handful. Now eventually a student did come forward to say that she had witnessed Half being yelled at by a student only a few days before they were murdered. She said that this male student was in his earth science class and after class, he stopped to talk to Half and began yelling at him over what appeared to be his schoolwork, but she was unaware of what was actually talked about. The student was also speaking Spanish, which made it even harder, but Half did know Spanish, as I told you before. The student was brought in for questioning and after investigators were talking to him, for a while, he informed them that he did have a collection of knives. And so he had admitted to this. And then they noticed that he also had a cut on his forehead. And this was a wound that could have been made by victims who were being killed. Well, this student claimed that he was only half joking when he was arguing with half and that in Spanish, it maybe sounded more argumentative than anything. And so they started looking more into his alibi and unfortunately this checked out. So they were back to square one. They were continuing to get tips from the college saying that there were suspicious people lurking around. There was a car with an out of state license plate that was in the area, but nothing was leading to a killer or a motive. Until the staff who worked with Half came forward to say that Half had gotten a promotion. Now, he had gotten the job over another man. And while a promotion or a job doesn't usually lead to murder, it was speculated that that is what could have happened in this case. Investigators found that this man actually lived in another part of the country, but had come to Hanover for all of the interviews and had been there at the time of the murders and had gone home since. So they decided to fly all the way out there and question him. They were also searching his vehicle and in the trunk, they found what appeared to be blood. They sent this in for testing though, and it was not. This was another dead end. 20 days after the murders on February 16th, a search warrant and arrest warrant was actually filed. And this brought no calmness, no peace to the community because the photo they were staring at of the men who were going to be arrested were not men. They were two teenage boys. This was 17-year-old Robert Tullock and 16-year-old Jimmy Parker, teenagers with seemingly no connection to the Xantops, who actually lived 20 minutes away in Vermont with their families. They weren't college students, they weren't faculty members, they had no connection to anyone, and they weren't friends or family either. Investigators had no idea what the motive could be at this point. These boys were considered armed and dangerous, and the entire country was asked to be on the lookout for them. Two days later though, Robert's mother's car was actually found abandoned at a truck stop in Massachusetts, which was two hours from Hanover. The next day, investigators were informed that the killers had somehow made it to Indiana. Now, a truck driver had actually picked them up as hitchhikers wanting to go to California. And when he asked over the radio, is there anybody who can take them further to California? Somebody answered and said, hey, meet me at this one truck stop and I can give them a ride. That is when a police officer who had pretended to be the truck driver got out and questioned them. 
before arresting them. They were sent back to Hanover by private jet, and although this was huge news to this small town, this search was not easy for investigators. It had all started with the sheaths for the knives that they had found at the crime scene. They knew that they were very unique, so they could find some way to trace it back to the seller and that would lead them to the owners. The knives were actually knives that were used by military and police, but they had found that it could also be bought online and this led them to 5,000 different people to look into. The FBI profiler was then on the case, as well as the whole FBI crew, and that is when he realized, by talking to other people, that Half was one who always carried his wallet. He was never anywhere without it. And that's when they realized Half's wallet actually wasn't anywhere on him or in the home. It could have been stolen. And this put a whole wrench in the entire investigation because before they said the motive couldn't be robbery. And now it could. Then one of those 5,000 leads about the knives was a hit. And two of these same knives that would be used with these sheaths were bought by a Jimmy Parker in Vermont. So investigators rushed to this address to find that Jimmy was only 16 years old and that was his parents' house. But Jimmy was actually there at that point. And he was talking to the investigators where he said he had bought them for him and a friend because they went rock climbing and they thought that it would help them. But when they came, they were actually too big and bulky, so they sold them. Jimmy was taken to the police station at this point while his friend Robert, who he had said had also been the other one that would get the knife, was questioned as well at his home. And Robert had the same exact story when they got there. But it was very interesting how it was exact word for word. But that wasn't the only reason Robert would be taken to the police station. It was also because when they asked to see the different shoes he wore on a normal basis, he brought out a hiking boot. These two boys were found to have no prior criminal record and Robert and Jimmy were denying involvement from the very beginning. They also refused to turn on each other to talk bad about each other, which is often done when you see teenage killing partners or even adult killing partners. They'll often turn on each other when it comes down to it, but these two didn't. And this continued after they were arrested from the truck stop the second time and brought in. The only reason they had been let out that first time was because there was no evidence against them yet, and so they had to release them. That night that they had first been arrested, they were let go, and then they were on the run. And 3 a.m. that next morning, the hiking boot came back as a match. Roberts did to the footprint at the home of the murders. That morning, investigators went to arrest them at their homes where they found they were actually gone and they had left notes for their parents saying that they were at the other's house, but they had completely disappeared. And they also had Robert's mother's car, which was a silver 1987 Audi. And she had no idea about any of this. After a search of their rooms, the murder weapons were actually found with blood on them and with help from the truck drivers and the witnesses saying that these boys were traveling from truck to truck and going by Sam and Tyler while hitchhiking, they were finally caught. With no more information being given by Jimmy and Robert, they needed one of them to crack. So they went after the youngest, 16-year-old Jimmy, and they began to tell him that they would get him a plea deal if he would confess and testify against Robert. They said that he would actually only get second degree murder and being an accomplice. And so that's when Jimmy talked. Both boys were from decent families in Vermont. As far as anybody could tell, they got good grades. Robert's family were actually in the furniture business and his mother was a nurse and said to be a very gentle mother and Robert was actually the president of his school council. Jimmy was known to be this funny, artistic boy who would play guitar, act in plays, and his family was actually building houses in the area as well as the town's public picnic shelter. They were always together. They were either playing outdoors or they were on the debate team and nothing seemed out of the ordinary with them until this. Jimmy began talking about how they were always bored, that there was nothing to do in this town, and that six months before the murders, they had gone to four homes, planning to talk their way in, get their ATM cards, their pins, 
and kill them, but they ended up not being able to go through with it. You know, Jimmy was saying they didn't want to go to college. They wanted more to life, and they were originally going to be Navy SEALs to get out of Vermont, but decided that they didn't want to have to do any of the training. So instead, they were going to train themselves to become killers. With this talent, they planned to kill and rob enough people to make it to Australia. Jimmy claimed that he didn't want to kill, he only wanted to make the money, and that Robert was actually planning to kill his own dog for practice, but Jimmy told him not to. A year prior, Jimmy said there was another instance where Robert saw an elderly couple and wanted to knock them out and kill them with rocks, but he didn't. And every time they broke into a home, no one was actually home until Half and Suzanne. Jimmy continued talking and it was very obvious to investigators that these two were under the delusion that they could simply kill and continue on with their lives with all this money they could get and they could end up going to this island where no one would be able to find them. They actually wanted to go to an island because they wanted to have spears and learn how to hunt and develop primitive instincts. They also admired Hitler for being able to manipulate people and they had the idea to eventually replace their bodies with machines to continue living forever. They believed they were smarter than everyone and that they could be hired assassins in their lives. These boys really did not have a grasp on reality and that was very clear. As far as the Xantops though, Jimmy said they were chosen that day just because their home looked expensive. They were walking around and they made it to their home and they approached the door saying that they were students conducting a research paper. It was actually an environmental study, which was just up Half's Alley. And of course, like I said, they invited everybody in, especially when it had something to do with school. And so Half let them in like he always did. And he was more than happy to talk to them. Jimmy said that he actually started to have second thoughts because they were very nice. Half sat them down at this table interview style while the teens asked him questions and pretend to be writing these down for the interview. Half then took out his wallet to actually give them a card of someone who he thought could help them and that is when Robert was said to lose it. He saw the money and he got out his knife. He began cutting Half in the face and that is when Suzanne, who was in the kitchen, came running at Half's screams and that is when Robert told Jimmy to slit her throat. But Jimmy said that he only regretted getting caught and only getting to leave there with $340. That he decided killing people wasn't the way to get money and that they were naive. They didn't think that they would be caught and they had actually realized that they left the knife sheaths and they had tried to go back but the cops were already at the home. Not only did the bloody footprint match Robert's shoe but the knives and the blood on the knives also matched Half and Suzanne. Jimmy's fingerprint matched the fingerprint found at the crime scene as well and the green station wagon that witnesses saw at the home was actually Jimmy's mother's car that they had gone there to basically look over the place to stake out before the kill. Inside that car, they actually found a matching blood stain to Suzanne. While awaiting trial, both boys had to continue their high school education. And at this point, Robert wanted to plead insanity, but ultimately pled guilty to first degree murder. Jimmy did testify against him while crying in the courtroom and apologizing to the family, but Robert sat emotionless, hearing everything. And this was even as the Xantops' daughter, Veronica, told the court about her parents and that Half's name actually translated from German to the word help, and that he was someone who had really helped the community. He was generous and he was kind and he was open and that he lived up to his name, but also that his kindness was what made this crime possible. And so that was one of the greatest violations of all. Robert was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And then Jimmy pled guilty to second degree murder and actually said to the Xantop's daughter, Veronica, there's not much I can say, I'm just really sorry. He was then sentenced to 25 years to life with the possibility of parole and 16. Jimmy's mother did say that she hopes that the Xantop's daughter will find peace in their hearts and forgiveness. While those 16 years passed with Jimmy being in jail, he 
then wanted to be released. He had gotten a master's degree in jail. He had been a model prisoner. And that is when many in the community spoke up and said he had already received a lighter sentence. He shouldn't be able to get out sooner now. Now he's asking for a sentence suspension. His attorney writing, Jim knows that the anguish his actions caused the Zantop's daughters, family and friends is immeasurable. Citing his age at the time of the crime and his behavior in prison, saying he earned a master's degree, is involved in art, theater, music and coaching sports. The state objects. The attorney general's office responding. Those reasons should be weighed against the longstanding criminal conspiracy the defendant willingly engaged in to rob and kill that led to the horrific deaths of two strangers in their home. Jimmy then withdrew his appeal and will be in prison until at least 2024, which is not too far away. While most agreed with these teens being locked up, there were still some who cannot fathom that children or teenagers can kill or can be evil. The town constable actually said to show support for teenagers charged with a brutal crime sets a bad example for the rest of the children. And to say it can't be true is irresponsible because it happened. It was found that the number of jail inmates from 16 to 21 in Vermont has actually risen by more than 77% in those three years around the time of the murders. It continues to be a phenomenon that is rising rapidly and many have theories as to why. Is it the media and how it is consumed, the constant saturation of news and horror desensitizing everybody? Is it the lack of care and protection of children, even at school? Is it simply an evil being caught earlier by our technology? Now, Robert's case is actually under review right now because the Supreme Court ruled that sentencing life without parole was unconstitutional for minors. However, nothing has happened in his trial yet. Four men serving life in uh, prison will get new sentencing hearings because of a Supreme Court decision about giving juveniles life sentences. Uh, Robert Tullock, Eduardo Lopez, Robert Dingman, and Michael Soto were all in their teens when they committed their crimes, and all were automatically sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In New Hampshire, as it stands right now, if you are convicted of first degree murder, you are automatically sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Now, the four men will remain in prison while the resentencing hearings are scheduled, and there's no word yet on when that might happen. Both of them are actually at the New Hampshire State Prison, but are said to have minimal contact anymore. Robert and Jimmy's families were actually given funds to help raise their other children by the Chelsea Community Cares. Now, a garden was created in the Zantop's honor and has the most beautiful plants and rocks all around it. Now, in 2021, for the 20th anniversary of their murders, the Dartmouth College actually held a memorial at their garden, and a friend and staff member who knew them well said, together they were just magical people. Those of us who remained continue to celebrate the community that they really, in many ways, started and nurtured. It was important to them that we carry it on, and they made that clear. But do you believe that Robert and Jimmy should have gotten the same exact sentence? Was Robert the leader here? Was Jimmy the follower? Or that were they equal in what they did? Would Jimmy really have said no to another murder with Robert? Or was that just what he said when they were caught? Why do you believe children are becoming criminals a lot more rapidly, it appears? or are we just catching them sooner than we used to in the past? Cases where the kids are killers, I think that we just push it to the wayside, just kind of like the elders when they're killers as well. It's something that we think of as innocence, and innocence can be very manipulating. So if you don't know, I've actually done a ton of these type of videos where it's the kids who kill, teens who kill, and I will put the playlist down below if you would like to catch up on those. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.